Turn to Exodus chapter 20. Uh, as you know, we've been going through the Ten Commandments. We're getting near the end. We're on number nine. Number nine. And so uh, as we're going through number nine, the Bible says in chapter 20 of Exodus, verse 16, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now we condense that basically and we just say don't lie. All right? That's what we say. Okay, don't lie. But in all honesty, it goes a little deeper than just that. It's not just telling any lie. There are specific things that are a real problem. And those specific things has to do with how it has, or what it has to do with your neighbor, with the people around you. Um, sometimes, you know, we can tell lies. We say, oh, that's such a little white lie or whatever. But the problem is, is how does it affect, in this passage, how does it affect the people around you? How does it affect their reputation? How does it affect what people think of them, um, their integrity, their character? How does it affect all of those things? And so anything that we do um, that affects or has a relationship to um, someone else's reputation or their character or integrity uh, being jeopardized, then it falls into this category, all right? But we have always just kind of condensed it and said, don't lie, all right, or thou shalt not lie if you want to keep it in the King James, all right? And so that's the issue. Now, in the final chapter of Revelation, we're told some things that I think is interesting and things we need to know when we're looking at this passage. Uh, in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14, he tells us that those who lie are not going to be a part of the city of God. Uh, included in that are some others, but he specifically adds this, and not only those who lie, but those who love a lie. Those who really enjoy hearing somebody else um, uh, malign somebody, you know, tell lies about them or gossip about them or whatever the case may be, any kind of untruth about these individuals. He's saying those people, God doesn't love them. God doesn't care for that. In Revelation twenty two fourteen, says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are, and then he has a whole list, and we get to whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So he's saying, listen, included in that list are those who lie and those who love to hear a lie. You know, it's interesting. I'm going, I'm going to take you back. Now we have the Internet that does all of this. But back in my day, if you wanted all the, uh, the juicy gossip, and it didn't matter if it was true or false, um, you got that um, from, the, uh, from the magazines as you checked out at the grocery store and uh, the Inquirer and whatever. And they had all these magazines, and people would love to gobble that up. We love to hear juicy stories, and I'm not so sure we care if it's the truth or not. We say that, see that a lot in political circles, you know, especially during the time when, you know, it's a, whether it's a presidential race or whether it's, you know, times where we're going to elect new congressmen or whatever the case may be. Um, but what happens is we don't really care when they say, well, this person does that and this person does this. We don't always take the time to really make sure those things are true you know, and we'll just repeat it as though it's gospel. And I find that interesting because we will say right up front, don't believe anything you hear on TV, but then we'll take what we hear on TV if it's in our favor, you know, if it's in a situation where we like it and then we apply it. Oh, well, I can repeat that because it's about the other guy, you know. But we need to understand that lying is wrong and, and, and uh, causing a lie to further go out or to love to hear a lie is equally as sinful. And so it's important that we understand. He tells us clearly that we, we're not to bear false witness against our neighbor, but we're also told in Revelation we're not to even, we're not to even love anybody who makes a lie. We're not to, to love the lie at all. All right. Now, God makes sure, according to this command, that we respect other people's reputation. So it's designed to safeguard the reputation of the people around us. Um, you know, a person can destroy their own character, and there's not much we can say about it, I guess. But it's not our job to destroy their reputation. It's not our job to break down their character. It's not for me to destroy them 
uh, with my lies. And so our reputation is incredibly important. Um, all the time we have people lie about us. I mean, it's just a common occurrence. I'll be real honest, it happens to me on a, a regular basis. And I think part of that's because Satan's attacks don't want people to believe you know, things that we say or things that we do. One of the one of the biggest attacks, and we see this a lot, all of you, maybe all of you who are on Facebook have probably um, had something similar to this happen to you. If you if you have an account or I don't know if they do this on other social media or not, I'm not on them, so I don't know how all that works. But I know on Facebook um, there are times where people hack into that and they they will pretend like they're you, you know, and they'll open up a new account like it's you. And sometimes they'll just send messages out that looks like it's a message from you, even though it wasn't. Sometimes they'll say things, do things, and it's just all a blatant lie just to make you look bad. Um, I very often will get messages sometimes from other pastors. It, at least it would lead me to believe that it was from other pastors. Um, wanting me to open up a, a site to see something or uh, or saying things that are hurtful, or saying things that are naughty and dirty and sinful, you know. And I know better than that. I know they're not going to do that. And so I know that someone has hacked their account, and I get it. I just scroll past it or block it or get rid of it or do something with it. But you know, I'm smart enough to know they're not the people that would do that. And so we got to be really careful that we don't believe a lie. I had someone call me one time. This was going back a couple of years at least. And uh, just, I mean, w was astonished that I would ever send a message that was so awful. And I said, I got news for you. I don't send messages. I didn't send that. You know, if I send a message, you're going to know clearly it's from me. And that's not from me. Well, it's just awful. I can't believe you. I didn't send. I'm trying to tell you, I didn't send that. But it came from you. I know you had to have sent. I did not send it. Someone has hacked my account. Get it in your head. I didn't send it. All right, you know better than I would never do. Well, I wouldn't have thought about you doing something like that. And I'm just really offended by it. I never did really, I think, convince them that I did not send that. I don't think they ever bought into it. Now they probably think that I'm this horrible, wicked guy that sends out porno, you know. <laughs> yeah, and it could very well be. I, who knows? But my point being, people love a lie. The world loves a lie. And if we're not very careful... We're quick to believe a lie. And the Bible's saying don't. Be really careful. Be real, real cautious about those things. Because in all honesty, our reputation is so important. Proverbs 22.1. A good name is rather be chosen than great riches and loving favor, favor rather than silver and gold. So God tells us, listen, your reputation is the most important thing you really have when it comes to dealing with people. So you have to really protect it. The Bible has a lot to say about lying. We can't even begin to touch on all of it. But I want to just mention a couple um, that, to give you the idea so that you understand. The, um, in Proverbs, this is a very familiar passage. Uh, we usually use it for some of the other things that are taking place there. But he says in Proverbs 6.16, 6, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven, are an abomination unto him. We've said this before, and it, and it names seven things. But it's interesting to me, twice he mentions lying. Out of the seven things, two of them deal with lying. He tells you this in verse 17, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 17. He says, this is, he says, these are things that God hates, okay? And seventh is an abomination. 17 says, a lying tongue. So God hates a lying tongue, hates it. That's a strong word. Have you ever thought about how strong a word hate is? I mean, hate is, I don't want anything to do with it. I despise it. Um, I, you know, it, it's, it's the contrary to love. It's the exact opposite of those things that God would love and care for. So in verse 17, he says a lying tongue. And then verse 19, he says a false witness that speaketh lies. So he's saying, I, I, number one, I hate a lying tongue. But number two, I hate that guy that lies. I hate, I hate the guy that does it. Now, we always talk about, you know, God doesn't hate anyone. I'm going to straighten you up here for just a second. All right? God does. Those who rebel against him in this fashion, those who ignore him, those who reject him, um, we see clearly that God does hate those individuals. Um, to give you an example of that, you look in the Old Testament, and we think, man, the Old Testament 
is a bloody mess. It really is. I mean, he has the nation Israel go into other nations and completely destroy them. I mean, when he says destroy them, he's talking about the men, women, children, animals, cattle, you name it, everything they have, you know. And, um, and we think, man, what is up with that? God hates sin. And these are people who are so engulfed in sin that these children are going to grow up in such a society of that, as that. He hates those individuals that have no regard for him and no regard for his laws. And so when we look at this, we, we well, wait a minute, but God so loved the world. Yes, he does. He gives us that option to trust him. He so loves us. He gives us an option that we don't have to die and go to hell because he does. That's what he wants for us. But for that very reason, because he loves us so much, he sent his only begotten son to die for us, for you to reject his son. Man, all of a sudden that love turns to a hate. I want nothing to do with this God. I want nothing to do with him. I reject him. And uh, I want nothing to do with his son. And so this is the flip side of who God is. Um, God is a loving God so much as I said. He sent his only begotten son to die for us so that we could have eternal life. So with all that kind of love and that display of love for somebody to reject that, man, is the epitome of hate, even on their part. So we see this and we see it happening. And in Proverbs 12, 22, he says this, Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. All right? So those that lie, God hates it. God absolutely hates it, calls it abomination. All right. Uh, lying is a part of our fallen nature, our sinful nature. Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. All right. He's saying, listen, right out of the womb, right out of the womb. He's saying we're we have a sinful nature. We're prone to lie. All right. Uh, right out of the womb, we are sinners. And I think it's important for us not to forget that. Um, it's not something we're not taught to be sinners. We are sinners. Um, and so that's what he's saying, all right? Now, as I said before, you know, when you're talking about being like even in the midst of, say, like uh, political battles, I think that's probably a good example. You see more slander during that time than probably any other time during the course of our society, at least, because they're always slamming each other. I always find it interesting. You First, you'll have the Republican debates. You'll have the Democratic re debates. Um, they're beat up on each other. I mean, they call each other names. You know, and I don't count. And this is in both, by the way. All right? Beat up on each other. You know, I remember back in the, the, the ones where Hillary Clinton stole a bunch of votes and caused Barry Sanders not to get a bunch of votes and and man it came public and the girl that did it all kind of got in trouble for it and what have you and and then after it was all said and done Hillary gets the candidacy for the Democratic Party they're all buddies again it's like how does that happen I mean for them to talk the way they do about each other and to beat up on each other the way they do and then all of a sudden they're buddies again you've seen it in the in the Republican campaign you have um Oh, his name just slipped my mind. Ran for president during that time. He's still big in Congress. Texas, <laughs> help me out. George w. No, no. Um, the other, uh, he's in Congress now. What's his name? Why is my mind just went blank? But anyway, Trump and him, uh, I mean, went at it. And Trump started, you know, calling his dad names and calling his family names and whatever. And, uh, I mean, they, it, it was a horrible thing. And, and so they wouldn't have anything to do with each other for a while, and it was awful. And then once everything got settled down, they became buddies again, and everything was all fine. And it just amazes me at how all of that can happen, you know. And, um, and so, you know, you have that whole concept in your political races and what have you where they just feed on the lies and on the slander. And, and it's like it's okay, it's accepted. But you know what? It ruins reputations, and it destroys friendships, and... And, uh, and it, it breaks down people's character, and it tells you something about a person. I'll just tell you, when, when people who lie on, on someone, and they're caught in that lie, I'll, I'll be real honest with you, I never look at them the same again. I can forgive them, and I can say it's, it's fine. But I'm going to tell you, there's a degree of trust that you lose, you know. It's kind of like saying, you know, well, you're supposed to be really forgiving to someone. Well, I, I can forgive someone. You know, someone, let's say you have someone that, <clears throat> let's say someone that gets saved and they have been in the past, oh, let's take it to the extreme. Let's say they were a pedophile, 
All right? And they get saved, and then they just, they are really brokenhearted over what they have been and what they have done, and, you know, and their life has changed, and there's something entirely different, and they profess that. They come to your church. They want to be a part of your church. I'm going to tell you now, I can forgive them. I can welcome them in, but they're not going to work in my nursery. You know what I'm saying? There is a degree of trust that you lose in some of that. You, your character gets broken, and, um, and, and you, you don't have the same reputation that you once had. And so what happens is, is, is if, you know, if our reputation is destroyed, I mean, we, we don't have the influence that maybe we would have otherwise. And so it's important that we keep those things intact. And sometimes people will say and do things that take it out of our control. I had a pastor friend who had taken in a teenage girl. He and his wife had taken in a teenage girl, trying to help her because her family would not. And, and uh, they took her in and tried to help raise her. And then she didn't get her way. And so she accused him of molesting her. And uh, he wound up losing his church, lost his wife. And, uh, I mean, his family fell apart. And he was just a mess. His character was destroyed. Everybody's thinking that's what took place, that he had molested this girl. A few years later, um, she came forward and, and confessed that she had made it all up because she didn't get her way. All right? And uh, it didn't put his marriage back together. It didn't get his church back. Um, his character and those who didn't hear her confession and those who don't know that she uh, you know, took all that back, that she said it just didn't happen. Well, his character in their eyes and his reputation is still bad. It's a shame that those things happen, but they can happen in a moment and uh, and all it takes sometimes all it takes is just someone saying something that's why it's so detrimental uh, when people say things about us and we have to be really cautious about that within the church man we got to be so careful of things that are said and things that are done and how we portray one another and things we say about one another um, I, I got to tell you now if you've got an alt with me don't go to somebody else talking about it. come to me let's get it squared away between us Let's not spread it all over the church. Let's, let's get it squared away. And that way, nobody's reputation is destroyed. Because you come to me, instead of going to an individual, and I'm going to tell you now, you've hurt your reputation with me. Because I'm thinking, if they'll talk about them that way, they'll talk about me that way. So understand, it's important that we control this tongue. All right? Lying also aligns you with Satan or this world rather than aligning you with God. John 8, 44. You guys know this passage. Ye are of your father the devil, the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. I'm going to come back to that because I think that's an interesting statement. And abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So, if you want to talk about lying, let's go back to the father of lies. Let's talk about Satan. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, he deceived Eve. And he deceived her first by kind of twisting up what God said. And then he just blatantly um, rejected what God said. Changed it all together. Just changed it all together. Said, you know, God said that this is what will happen. And God didn't say these things, but he made it up and he said it. Um, so he lied about God, he lies about himself, he lies about the world, he promises things that he cannot produce, and he makes the things of the world seem so much more important than they really are. That's the lies of Satan. He wants you to think that everything in this world, man, is so much more important than God's people, God's church, God's word, God's message. So much more important. He makes it look so enticing. I'll just be real honest with you. Right now is an enticement. You know, our, our beloved Bengals are doing really well. Everybody wants to see the Bengals win. I'd love to see them win. I think it'd be cool if they won the Super Bowl. But here's the thing. He makes that so enticing that somebody came up and gave you tickets be like, oh, dude, I got to miss church for this. Why? What's the most important thing? See, Satan makes it look like, I mean, even if they, somebody here tell me who won the Super Bowl five years ago. Help me out. Bengals, probably. No, they've never won the Super Bowl. See, 
if you figure it out, it's because you're going to sit there and think and think and think and think and start naming all the ones you can think of that won. And um, yeah, so what happens? You know, here's the deal. What he does offer and tell you that's so important. Man, it's so important. People forget it in five years. You know, we may not because it's our town. But I'm saying those things will be long forgotten. Those things will be long forgotten. And so, you know, when you stop and think those things through and you start concerning yourself with those things, you make them so much more important if you're not real careful than the things of God. That's a satanic lie. And so what we have to be careful is not to let him fill our hearts with the lies of this world. By the way, I said we was going to come back to that statement. I, I found this interesting. He says, you are of your father the devil, the lust of your father you will do. By the way, he's saying those people who are lying and believing a lie, the father is not God, it's the devil. He makes that clear right there. Your father, he says. That's who your father is. But he says he was a murderer from the beginning. Now, that's a hard statement. From the beginning of what? From the beginning of where? And how did he become a murderer? I thought he was just a liar. All right? But what really happens is, is in a nutshell, I ain't got time to get into this. It's not about this. It's about lying. But... Keep in mind, he says, from Satan's beginning, or is it just from the beginning of the world? I don't know. But from the very moment of the beginning, he murders. Which tells me that whatever he did in the Garden of Eden there with Adam and Eve took place right in the beginning. I don't think there was this large span of time. People say we have no idea how much time expired before he did this. Well, no, we don't. But I don't imagine it was much because he says, from the beginning, uh, I don't know about you, but everything I've ever read, the beginning is, is, is in the front. <laughs> it's, the, it's the front side, all right? Not in the middle, not any time else. It's in the beginning. And he says he's a murderer. You would have thought he said he was a liar, but he was a murderer. You see what happens? He was a murderer because what did his lies cause? His lies caused a spiritual death and a physical death upon man. They believed his lies. And because they believed his lies, they rebelled, and they died spiritually, and they brought about a physical death. One day they would die physically. He was a murderer from the beginning. His lies is what brought mankind into the place that we are. We die because of him, because of his lies, because of mankind believing it. But I'm saying that deception. So he was a murderer from the beginning. He didn't care about us. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care that you'll die spiritually. doesn't care that you die physically. He doesn't care about you. And so when he makes the things of the world look good, he's lying to you. When he makes it look like it, it is something of value, he's lying to you. When we get the idea that, God, I want all of these blessings in this world. I want all. It's a lie from Satan. Those things aren't that valuable. What's valuable are those things that are eternal when he talks about laying up your treasures in heaven. All right? So it's a blatant lie. Um, Peter accused Ananias and Sapphira of being influenced by Satan when they lied about the money for the property sale. You remember what happened with Ananias and uh, Sapphira uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the, the, the church there in Jerusalem? After Pentecost, a bunch of them got all excited because they had property and that kind of stuff. Many of them sold what they had so they could help everybody take care of their families because there was a lot of persecution going on and they're losing jobs and family needed to be taken care of. And so, <clears throat> and so a lot of them were selling the property. You see that happen with Barnabas. Ananias and Sapphira sell their property. And then they come and they said, we're giving all that we got, we're giving all of our money to the church to help disperse to the people. And they hadn't. They had held back some. And if you remember, they were told, listen, it was yours to keep. You didn't have to give it. You chose to give it. So don't lie about what you gave. You could have just simply said, we're going to give half to the church, or we're going to keep half. Everything would have been fine. But instead, they wanted to look big. We're giving you everything. When in reality, they held back some for themselves. So they lied about having held that back. Here's what it says in Acts 5.3. But Peter said, Ananias, listen to this. Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? That's an interesting question. Why did Satan do that? I don't know why Satan does what he does. He's a liar and a thief, I guess. 
But you know what the question is? The question is really this. Why'd you let Satan do this? Why'd you fall into his trap? Why did you allow Satan to dictate what you were to do? You took a good thing and let Satan destroy it. You took something you was doing that was an incredible thing and a wonderful thing and could have been used greatly. And just because you wanted a little notoriety for it, you ruined it. And so you lied about it. You let Satan do that to you. That happens so many times. Uh, we, all, we can all fall into this trap pretty easy, by the way. Any one of us can fall into this trap. And the trap is, I'm going to do something good because God has led me to do that something good, but we've got to make sure that somebody knows about it because we don't want to do it and not get noticed. Boy, God forbid that I would do something and not get a little recognition for it, you know. Understand, if we're not careful, we're doing it for all the wrong reasons, and we're making it look like we care, when in reality, what we, what we are are people who want attention. And we lie. We're lying even in a good deed. Lying even in a good deed. And so he's saying, be careful about this. And this is what Ananias did. They did an incredible thing. They gave a lot of money to the church, but they held back a portion and then lied and said they had given it because they wanted it to look bigger and better than what it was. All right? So it's important that we're careful about that. And uh, if we're not careful too, you know, have you ever noticed that we kind of sometimes will try to justify things that we do? That's Satan's attack too. That's Satan lying to us, telling us that it's okay to do that. It's okay. This, this sin's not that big of an issue. Oh, it would be if it was in Floyd's life, but it's not in Floyd's life. It's in my life. So I've got it under control. That's Satan lying to you. And sometimes I know it's there, and I'll take it to God, and I'll pray about it, and I'll get it squared away. That's Satan lying to you. You can't justify sin. If there's sin in your life, and you think God's okay with it, you're being lied to. You're being lied to, all right? Now, notice how we can even lie to ourselves. In 1 John 1, 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If I say, man, I'm in fellowship with God, I love him, he and I, man, we're like this, but we don't walk in that same fellowship. We walk in darkness, that is, if we walk with sin, let sin dictate what we do, we have no fellowship with him. 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If you think you're not a sinner, think again. All right. Um, by the way, can we accuse God of lying? No. Yeah, well, we can accuse him, I guess, but it's not a wise thing to do. 1 John 1, 10, if we say that we've sinned, we make him a... Oh, I'm, let me say that again. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Wow. If we say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. I don't have any sin in my life. We've made God a liar. How do we make God a liar? Because he had just said, we say, um, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth's not in us. Well, so it... And come short of the glory of God. Yeah. And so we understand that. But the interesting thing here is it, it, this passage... It just, just throw this in extra. This got nothing to do with our lesson. This passage actually clarifies the fact that John was writing under the inspiration of God. Notice that? Because it was in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth's not in us. All right? And then only two verses down, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him, who's him? God. Make God a liar, and his word is not in us. So what are we saying? You're saying that what I just said back in verse 8 is not true, and, you're, and, and it was from God's inspiration that I said it. So he's saying, you make God a liar if you don't believe it. So he actually confirms the inspiration of the word right there. All right. Can we be judged by our lies? Listen to this, Matthew 12, 36, but I say unto you. You need to hear this because this is one that, that we probably overlook sometimes. That every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. I don't like that verse. <laughs> I've, I've, I've committed too much idle words. Uh, we've, we've probably all said plenty of things that we wish we could take back, that we wish we had never said, that probably hurt people's lives, 
that maybe even hurt our own reputation as well as somebody else's. And he says, every idle word, we're going to give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. God's saying, we'll take your word on this and see what you have to say about it and see what, what pans out. So All right. are you saying that we'll be condemned for the things we do? Like I think we'll be judged by the, we'll be, he'll judge us for the things we say. Okay. Every word. I think that those who are lost will be, yes. When he's talking about the judgment here, for the lost, it'll be at the white throne of judgment. For the saved, it'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. For the lost, they will be condemned unto hell for the rejection. God, I want nothing to do with you. I reject you. And for the saved individuals, we will lose rewards. We will not receive blessings that he wants us to receive. Because we have said and done things that are contrary to his word. Okay. All right. Um, now, I want you to notice, too. Um, I, oh, let me read this last verse. Revelation 21, 8, just because it's a hard, hard one. Um, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Now, I want to stop there for a second. He doesn't say, but all the fearful, all the unbelieving, all the abominable, all the murderers. He doesn't do that. He just lists all them by name. All right. He just says the fearful, unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, and idolaters. But then he adds the word all to liars. And all, not some, not a few, all liars. Now, I want you to understand something. This is not those who have lied, went to God, sought forgiveness, and received forgiveness. These are people living that lie. These are people that have designed their life. Their life is built around being a liar. You know, saying things that are a lie, believing things that are a lie, condemning people with a lie hurting reputations with a lie, and it becomes your lifestyle. It's who you are, and you justify it, or you're able to live with it without the, without the, uh, the, the guilt. He's saying these are the people that are liars, all right? We can all sin, and if you think you're not going to sin, think again, all right? We can all sin from time to time, and in all likelihood, every single solitary one of us has told a lie at some point in time, all right? And by the way, a lie is a lie is a lie. There's no such thing as little white lies and big old black lies. All right? A lie is a lie. All right? So, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire with burnt with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, notice the varying, various types of lies. I don't have time to really get into this, but because um, I really have poked around for some reason. I don't know. Slander is a type of lie. Psalm 101.5, Whoso privately slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Slander means basically to defame or to injure maliciously by uttering some type of a false report. They did this, they did that, when they didn't, all right? Something false. A talebearer or a gossiper is the way we would probably term that. Leviticus 19.16, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among the people. It's a person who tells these idle tales about individuals that not, does not necessarily have any truth attached to them. Um, they're far less concerned about the truth, uh, more concerned about the gossip, because that's what's important. You find something bad on somebody, man, I'm telling you, we, we want to spread that a whole lot faster when we find something good. We ought to not be so hesitant to praise people. We ought to not be so hesitant to say these are good people, and these people... Are, are godly individuals and they seem to do the work that God has called. We need not to be hesitant about that, by the way, and not be so upset about it. We ought to do that. Um, instead of finding fault, we ought to find the good. Um, backbiters, whisperers, backstabbers, those who insinuate things. Uh, Proverbs 6, 12 through 14, you can read that. It talks about the frowardness of your mouth and heart. Um, a lie can destroy so much. Um, we've talked about that enough. I can just kind of get past all of that, I guess. And listening to that lie is every bit as bad as telling that lie. If somebody is telling you a lie and you know it's a lie, 
you got to stop them. Don't listen to it. Stop. I, I have no notion to hear a lie. I know you maybe even believe that. You have nothing to back it up. You have no proof of it. And if you did, you ought to go to that. Have you been to that individual? Don't tell me. Don't tell me this thing. Um, if you're telling me instead of the individual, you're lying about it. I don't want to hear it. All right. Go to that individual. If you can't work it out with him, go through the proper channels. Get it done the way the Bible says to do it. We should never, there should never, ever, ever be a time where I'm sharing with Miss Cheryl here about something that Miss Penny did. There should never, there is never a time that should happen. I go to Miss Cheryl and I say, Cheryl, I heard this about you and it's being spread around. You might want to put a stop to it. You know, I'm going to take it to her. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's what I'm instructed to do. Uh, Y'all got no business hearing about it. It's between her and I. We need to fix this. She don't listen. She says, tough. You don't like it? It's your problem. So now I've got, I've got to go find me a, somebody else. Let me go get a deacon or something. We're going to come back to you again. Hey, let's get this thing right. Come on. I just want to see, I want to see you be able to be blessed. I want to get this thing right. All right. But there never is that point in time where I think it's necessary for me to take it to anybody else. You know. And when we see people off in the corner, what are we going to do? We're going to suspect that's what they're doing. Because he tells us not to be whisperers, not to be doing that, not to even look like it. We need to not even look like we're doing something like that. All right? So we need to combat it. We need to stand up against it. We combat it by being more and more like Christ. John 14, 6, Christ is the way, the what? Truth. Truth and the life. He's not the lie, right? We need to desire the same things that Jesus desires. Psalm 51, 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in thine inward parts. All right? We need to learn and love the truth. Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever... Th- Absolutely. There you go. Give her, give her a hand. That was good. All right? That's a, everybody needs to learn that one, don't they? That's right. All right? So we don't want to dwell on things that are malicious. We want to be thinking about good things, thinking about the truth. Man, if somebody tells me a lie about you, the last thing I need to do is be dwelling on that. I need to be thinking about something that's the truth. There's no way Kenny Simpson would ever say that or do that. Don't tell me that. Kenny, you ought to hear what people are saying. That's the way that ought to work. All right? And so understand we need to think about things that are right, things that are true, and we need to lastly live that truth. Ephesians 4.25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. All right? Ain't my job to beat you up. It's my job to encourage you, edify you. That's what the job is of the church. That's what we're supposed to do one with another. We ain't got time for all that other nonsense. Oh, man. Well, that's the problem. You know, uh, Satan leads us to do those things, and we fall prey to it. And and we're all guilty. I'm not standing up here trying to tell you that you guys ought to straighten up, and I'm doing everything right. That's not the way I'm saying. We all are guilty of that from time to time. But you know what? Be called out on it. If I come to you and I'm I'm talking about somebody, don't be afraid to say, Pastor, you ought not be talking like that. You ought not be saying that to me. And, you, and you'd be right. Stop me. You know, we're all guilty. Stop. Stop it. Stop it. We ought not be that kind of people. All right? So, thou shalt not lie. You got to do it fast. My question is, how do I get somebody to hear, hear what <coughs> four nine set, I mean, four eight says of Philippians? Because if they don't want to listen to that verse, then it's... That verse is for you. That's a personal verse. That verse is for me. It's a personal verse. Um, I can't always make people think right. What they have to do is be convicted by the Holy Spirit of God. That verse is for me to read it, see it, and apply it. And so, I, when you figure it out, let me know. I've been preaching for a lot of years. I can't even get saved people to figure it out. Okay, so... <laughs> I hear you. Well, all you can do is live it, live it yourself, and let them see it in you, so that they'll they'll want to hear it from you. 
All right. All right, guys, appreciate all of you. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Father, Lord, thank you for the day. Thank you for the opportunity to once again share your word, and we just pray that you bless it and use it. We love you, Lord, in all you do in Jesus' name. Amen.